Good afternoon and welcome to the May 26, 2022 work session of the Himrico County School Board. I would like to take note of why we have a familiar face next to me. It is not our usual face. And Dr. Teigen um, is here um, in person as the superintendent's designee, while the superintendent joins us virtually out of abundance of caution. Dr. Cashwell, thank you for joining us virtually. And Dr. Teigen, thank you for acting as the superintendent's designee in person. Um, since this uh, is not a board member, we do not need to um, vote on virtual participation, nor do we need to use roll call votes. Uh, so moving on to the agenda, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move that the school board approve the agenda for today's meeting. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, the agenda is approved. The next item on the agenda is closed session. Is there a motion to go into closed session? I move for the school board go into closed session for the discussion of matters under items A1 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia, 1950 as amended, pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific board employees. Moved by Ms. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Um, we will now go into closed session. We will reconvene the work session at the conclusion of our closed meeting. Is there a motion to clarify, certify closed session? Welcome back. I move that the school board, oh, uh, the school board certify by a recorded vote that to the best of each school board member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion authorizing the closed meeting were heard, discussed, and considered in the closed meeting. No uh, Moved by Ms. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The closed session has been certified. Dr. Cashwell will now present the superintendent's items. Thank you, Chair Shea. Members of the board, good afternoon. For the first item, I am seeking your approval of administrative appointments. Is there a motion to approve the administrative appointments? I move the school board approve the appointment of administrative personnel. Moved by Ms. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Second by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The administrative appointments are approved. Thank you. And the board has just approved Charlie Goad as the next principal of Chamberlain Elementary School, effective July 1st. We look forward to welcoming him to the new role. For the next item, we have, um, I am going to be seeking your approval at our monthly meeting, but want to present for you for your information and consideration now some revisions to the 2022-2023 school year calendar, which uh, has previously been approved by the board, but we are recommending some revisions to add two staff and student wellness days. Also, uh, the potential of two holidays that would be used uh, given the availability of banked instructional time and a professional learning day. Dr. Teigen is going to share information related to the calendar committee's uh, recommendation. Good afternoon, Chair Shea, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. Today, I'm here to share revisions to the 2022 2023 school calendar. Members of the calendar committee reflected on this past year when changes to the calendar were made throughout the year and they felt a more proactive approach would be appreciated by staff and families as we prepare for 22-23. As such, three aspects of the approved calendar were reviewed and suggestions made relative to wellness days, banked instructional time, and teacher pre-service week, starting with the wellness days. 
Based on the feedback received related to the impact the wellness days had for staff and students for the previous two years, two wellness days will be added to the 2022-2023 school calendar. Thus, it is proposed that schools and offices will be closed on Monday, November 7th and Friday, March 10th. The Monday, November 7th Wellness Day provides students with a four-day weekend and staff with a three-day weekend followed by a virtual professional learning and clerical day for teachers on Election Day, Tuesday, November 8th. The March 10th Wellness Day provides staff and families with a three-day weekend midway between President's Day and Spring Break. In addition to the wellness days, the use, use of banked instructional time to provide some breaks throughout the spring were also received. Therefore, should there be sufficient banked instructional time, the recommendation is to make Friday, February 17th, a holiday for all staff. This again creates a four-day weekend for students and a three-day weekend for staff. Monday, February 20th, is a professional learning day for teachers. The second recommendation was to make Friday, May 26th, a holiday for all staff to provide a four-day Memorial Day weekend for everyone. As was done this past winter, staff will monitor the use of time for inclement weather days, and staff and families will be notified no later than February 1st, 2023, if there was sufficient bank time to change February 17th and May 26th from tentative confirmed staff, from tentative to confirmed staff and student holidays. The last change is clarifying the Wednesday of teacher pre-service week. It, designate, it is designated for centrally planned professional learning for all teachers pre-K through 12. As some teachers prefer to participate in professional learning earlier in the summer as they begin to plan for the school year, the teaching and learning staff will be providing the required trainings throughout the summer. Those who choose to participate prior to teacher pre-service week will not be required to do additional professional learning on August 24th. Only teachers who opted to wait until teacher pre-service week will need to complete the required training on August 24th. With this update, we hope the hope is that there will not be a need to make additional changes for the 22-23 school calendar moving forward. And I will be happy to answer any questions you may have as um, you will be asked later this evening to approve these revised 22-23 calendar. Thank you, Dr. Tygen. Uh, colleagues, any questions or comments on this side? I'll start over here. This side. Reverend? I'm just excited that we as a board and Dr. Cashwell and the staff recognize the importance of wellness days um, for our students and staff. And so thank you, Dr. Tigan and the committee for your concerted intentional effort to ensure the inclusion of, of the time as well as the bank days. So thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Mansella, I would, I would like to uh, thank the committee for, for really taking time to think about where those days are most logical um, and putting them on either uh, Mondays or Fridays uh, so that we have continuity during the school week for learning for our students, but also in terms of childcare for our families. You're welcome. Oh, Kinsella, Ms. Kinsella. <laughs> Sorry. So, so Dr. Tagan. <laughs> I know that we heard from um, some constituents as to the lunar calendar and how some of our holidays are affected um, by it. Did the committee ha actually revisit it? Or if you could explain how that process works for anyone who may reference this, this conversation. Absolutely. Um, we rely on our faith leaders as, you know, to identify um, when those holidays fall. We have sought additional guidance, and at this time, there isn't additional guidance for next year that if it was believed that this year was just anomaly. Um, and so we have stuck with the date that has been published for 22-23. Uh, 
Thank you so much for uh, bringing clarity to that. That's all I have, Mrs. Shea. The next item. I don't know if Dr. Cashwell was oh. Dr. Cashwell, we are done with this item. Would you like to introduce our next item? I'd be happy to. And uh, thank you, Dr. Teigen, for the calendar revisions uh, and board members for your comments and questions. The next uh, three items are related to proposed policy revisions. Uh, these are coming to you from the policy committee for a first look. Uh, and an opportunity to ask any questions, as is uh, the case typically with policies. These would then go out for public comment. I know we've already received some feedback related to these, which will, of course, be shared uh, with the policy committee for further consideration as they're being shaped up and eventually brought to you at a subsequent meeting um, seeking your approval. So the first policy uh, to review are revisions to policy P2-05-004. This is the citizen stakeholder and participation policy um, and would offer an opportunity. And again, Dr. Teigen uh, has oversight of that committee and she'd be happy to answer any questions you may have related to that. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions or comments on this policy? Ms. Atkins. Thank you so much, Chair Shea. Dr. Teigen, I did have uh, a few thoughts and questions as well to be considered. I know this is the first uh, discussion, uh, and so more, I'm sure, to come. Uh, but I think the best way to do it is I'm going to share my thoughts and then in questions in sections as the changes are recommended before us. So I'll start with uh, just a recommendation of adding the definition of public form to the policy. And, you know, for example, in here, you know, monthly school board meetings shall include a public form and then flow into what is a public, uh, a public form. Uh, and whatever the team decides in defining what it is. But I think it's important to define what public forum is for Henrico County Public Schools and then flow into the management of the public forums. And so I'll flow into the management pieces in this policy, starting with the third paragraph, uh, which states, to ensure the school board has the opportunity to hear from as many speakers as possible it is requested that only one member of each household reserve a spot to speak. Uh, I have pause in this particular recommendation because households may have differing opinions in them, particularly when we are thinking about our youth. Uh, in this particular case where only one person per household, you can have a parent and a student that wish to participate in the process and they would have to choose. And I don't think that it's fair or equitable to have a household that may be intergenerational. You may have two families in one household and they have to decipher between who is going to speak. So I'll ask the policy committee to just take another look at that and really think beyond you know, a one family household. You do have households with multiple families in them. The second, uh, I guess, thought is around moving to the fifth paragraph, uh, which states, the board may also give individuals who have not presented a written or, or request an opportunity to be heard during the public forum. In this particular recommendation, I'm curious as to what criteria will be used to determine who gets heard. So I don't think that I definitely understand the statement. So if maybe you could explain it to me a little bit better. Uh, in other words, what's the basis for the decision? So if there's someone that did not sign up and there's a decision that, you know what, I think we'll go ahead and let someone speak. What's the basis for that to ensure that it's fair across the board? The conversation around this was more about should a, there not necessarily a, gen, a generic general statement as to when it would or would not be approved, but when it came to the level of the board and the board chair was supportive of being able to include additional individuals, that that could happen. Were there conversations to determine to make sure that we're doing it the same each time? 
Not necessarily on the conditions, but on the process more so. Okay. Than, um, and if you don't mind, Dr. Tigan, I'll add to that. Mm -hmm. um, part of our discussion was based on what we've done in the past. Um, if there have been no speakers or there have been, there's a, a large group present, if the chair would, de would decide to allow people who did not sign up to speak, in the past it's been anyone. Mm -hmm. it, it, if you allow one, you allow all right. that might want to speak. And, and the chair would say, is there anyone else who would like to address the board? And then as long as people want to address the board, they're allowed to. You wouldn't select, yes, you may and may, you may not. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be done that way. And at least that's the way it's been done in the past. Because mm -hmm. um, the purpose of a lot of these changes is to reflect what we actually do. And most of the time we limit ourselves to um, only people who have signed up in advance. But let's say, for example, we were to have a meeting where no one signed up, but we were made aware that somebody had come in person. They could, the chair would have the ability to say, you know, no one signed up, but we're gonna uh, take anyone from the audience who would like to speak. And then you would take everyone. Does that make sense and cover? I think our discussion, didn't it, Mrs. Kinsella? It, it did, and with our addition of written online public comment opportunities for folks, um, I don't think we felt, I don't think the committee at least, I mean, this is why we bring it forward, right, and discuss it, and then um, ask for public comment. Um, the committee didn't feel like just having a standing, just show up to speak. Mm -hmm. we, we do like that folks at least sign up um, in advance. And it, again, we add a written public comment that's another avenue for folks uh, to have an opportunity where it's both on the record and they're, and they're heard and we also get the comments before meetings, so. And this is something we can yeah. certainly take back to the policy Absolutely. committee to um, try to refine so that it's more defined for the public. Well, and personally, I appreciate your opinion and your suggestion that varying households could have varying opinions. When we discussed this uh, during our policy committee meeting, no one brought that up. And I honestly hadn't thought about it that way. We did it because um, in the past, we've had multiple household members speak, you know, two or three or four, and then that takes a lot longer and they were repetitive mm -hmm. oftentimes. So I think that was the way I looked at it is if, you know, generally speaking, it, when this has happened in the past, it's been repetitive, but we didn't think about the fact that you could have multiple families in one household or varying opinions. Um, so I think that is something that we really do need to consider um, how we might change this language to reflect that possibility. Because, um, I, I mean, you could even say something on the same topic or with the same thoughts, mm -hmm. because, uh, like I said, in the past, it's just become repetitive. People would say the same thing over right. and over again. Right. And so trying to hear from everyone, n nobody wants to squelch or, or limit the amount of feedback that we receive, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the thought that if it was repetitive, but you bring up a really good point about varying opinions. And I think where, where my thought process was, that was a smaller piece, but the bigger piece is as I see our students more engaged civically, mm -hmm. I don't want us to limit their participation because we have families with students, and if they have to choose between their child having the opportunity to practice civic engagement, I don't think we want to do that. That's so just point. something to consider. That's a very good point. And we'll add that, to, I'll make sure that the committee gets those comments. And then uh, there was one other area just for consideration to, to think about is the, I think it's the ninth paragraph, that's what I have written here, but double check that. Uh, so going to the ninth paragraph, no signs, posters, banners, like objects, shall be permitted in the school board's meeting room during any school board public meeting, public hearing, or town hall. And certainly voices are powerful. 
However, individuals express themselves in different ways. And I'm thinking about our students and our children. Sometimes that does come in the form of a sign or a t-shirt. Hands down, it should be peacefully, always. However, I want to just share one thought for the policy committee to, to think about. And perhaps instead of removing expression in this space, uh, provide standards and requirements uh, around maybe the verbiage, permissibility, the location and content. So for me, on those particular areas, I think one, what that would do is would make it fair so that you would avoid one group of people coming in with posters and another one without. I also think that it allows freedom of expression from children, from students as well, who may not want to publicly come to the microphone. And we have that, where they may come with a t-shirt and so forth and so on. So just for consideration, as you look at trends, and as you look at research, really consider not removing it, but providing requirements around it. So just a thought. Absolutely. I know some of the um, concerns were about being able to screen the appropriateness of signs as well as blocking the views of those in the mm -hmm. meeting. And so we can maybe consider you know, signs being appropriate outside or that, but we'll take that back to the committee for. Certainly, and particularly you. when we're thinking about, you know, as you're having your conversations and certainly you guys will be doing more research than what I have. But I think it's an opportunity when we're thinking about our youth to provide real guidance to them on how to do it. And I think we can be a leader in showing them around civic engagement in that space. So thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Ms. Atkins. Ms. Kinsella from the Policy Committee had a, a follow-up. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that point. I know that we were trying to stay away from, as Dr. Tigan said, is signs that obstruct or signs um, that, have, that are offensive or use uh, profanity. So I appreciate that. We'll take it back and continue the conversation. I mean, that's what this is for. So, well, we have so thank you. We have a standing Monday meeting, so we can meet and talk about this and all of them actually on Monday. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Ms. Ogburn, do you have anything else to add? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, just to repeat that um, this, we're trying to get this policy in line with what we do. And um, so, for example, the um, we have taken our three um, speakers don't have, cannot have more than three minutes, change that to two minutes, because that is what we've been doing for over, for about two years. And so we, again, we are trying to get this policy and all of our policies through the policy committee in line with actual practice. And so that, the reason for that change, because I know we have a couple of comments in our public comment today in, in regards to that. And so I just wanted to bring that up um, as far as this policy and the others is that we're really trying to get them in line. May I share one thought? I'm glad you shared that, mm -hmm. Miss um, Ogburn, because I thought about that three minute time frame and uh, then I started actually to go back on YouTube and look at some of our meetings. I wonder, along with that, if we could add what to do if it goes over your time frame. So I, I kind of wrote out a thought that I'll share here. Um, a statement advising that issues requiring more than three minutes and possibly requiring board action or responses should be addressed through X, Y, Z, whatever protocols we have. Because my, my concern with the statement is we certainly want to hear as many as we can, but what about that person that gives their heart out at the mic and they're not done, and then they just walk through the door? Perhaps there's some way we can add a sentence to say, if you do get cut off in essence, here's what you can do next. So just something to consider. Right, and, and I will, we did talk about this, and that's why we, in this um, policy is the ability to give a written statement to board members. So if a person want, and we could move that so that those are together. That might be a way to handle that. That if a person has additional thoughts, they are absolutely permitted to bring to our clerks their comments. They could have them in writing and give them to us. And if it's longer than the two minutes, that, that way we still have the benefit of their thoughts. Yeah. Um, so we could move that and put those two together. 
And also no noting that staff would follow up with those individuals. Right, you know, we with, probably, yeah, yeah we, we ought to add that, okay. I'm sorry, that's all I have. No, no that's no, fine, that's just great. checking Second this time. side to make sure. <laughs> all right, how about this side? What you got? Can I just jump out there, Roscoe? Um, if I may just add that this is a, a process, you know, going through all these policies is, is something that we've been doing, I believe since Dr. Cashwell came on mm -hmm. um, in July, 2018. Am I correct, Dr. Cashwell, that this was your initiative to go through all of our policies, some of which had not been updated um, in, in quite some time? That is correct, Mrs. Kinsella, uh, wanting to make sure that our policies do uh, reflect practice and any updated uh, legislative requirements, um, and also that we developed a policy committee whereby there was an opportunity to um, have discussion about policies, hear from staff, our stakeholders, and of course the, the school board ultimately seeking um, your approval for any changes. So um, it's been a significant lift, and I and we've come a long way and, and as you can see from the discussion here, uh, it's not easy work, but it's important work and uh, we're really grateful for uh, board member feedback related to the suggested revisions and of course the stakeholder feedback we've received so far on these revisions and will see receive uh, through that stakeholder input process in the coming weeks. And then Dr. Tagen, because of the nature of um, some policies, the public and stakeholders may be more interested in. How, what are all of the ways that we will communicate this public comment period for folks? I know we use um, our family newsletter, the binder. That's how, I mean, one way. Can you perhaps highlight how else we'll let families know these are out there for public uh, comment? Yes, there's inf there'll be information on the website where they can actually provide comment They'll, um, I would say, and I'm looking at um, Eileen there to make sure that that'll be on social media as well as clipboard and for our staff as well as the binder for our families. Thank you. Since I sit on the policy committee um, that meets every Monday, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. I would like to just echo Ms. Kinsella's suggestion of utilizing perhaps um, the uh, binder, the binder um, to communicate this to our families. Um, I think that's a, a great way to kind of summarize what's happened in our school board meetings for those who may not tune in to our hours and hours of fun every other week. Uh, but it can be just like a quick snapshot for people who want uh, additional information. I understand that the intent of um, some of the edits in this policy are to be more clear and more explicit as to what our actual practice is. Um, I have a suggestion for the um, policy committee just to consider and just to um, uh, talk about is, is when we talk about the, the time limit for speaking, um, if we wanted to give something, the, the reason two minutes is in here is because that is what we do and we're trying to communicate what we do. However, if we wanted to provide um, more flexibility, um, depending on how things ebb and flow with the volume of speakers, um, we could uh, perhaps consider some language such that um, you, the amount of time noted in the sign up document or designated by the chair. If we wanted to add flexibility there, um, kind of for meeting to meeting, like through the seasons of um, more and less public speakers. So I just uh, provide that suggestion to be considered. Any other items or any other thoughts on this item, I should say. All right, hearing none, Dr. Cashwell, the next item. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, yes. The next item is related to policy P4-11, which is political activities. And again, proposed revisions here. Um, should there be any questions? And again, we'll be soliciting feedback on this before bringing back any final suggestions for your approval. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. I'll start on my right. Any thoughts, concerns, questions? Ms. Kinsella? None at this time, I, mine are already in here. For um, And again, if I may just highlight with this policy that it's practice. So we're trying to um, bring clarity to our actual practices. Thank you. On this side? And I will just add, um, 
that um, we had have had a couple of comments about this one um, in our public forum for today. <clears throat> Excuse me, in our written comments. And um, in the third paragraph, this is allowing for and clarifying the use of political information, um, issue-oriented materials, et cetera, and those need to be curriculum-based. For example, if you're a government teacher and it is the year of a presidential election, you might have materials available on all of the candidates. You know, if you wanted to do that, if that was part of your curriculum-based um, instruction that you're doing. But we want to make it clear that there is no room for this if it's not curriculum based. So that language uh, we really did work on to make sure that um, it is, uh, so if a parent were to see something in a school that was political in nature, that it should be curriculum based and that should be their expectation. And so we, but we have had parents say, well, you know, I've seen political materials in the classroom or whatever. And it, again, it is going to be curriculum based. Um, and what we also um, have different revisions in here about um, when we, uh, what our expectations are for our employees and whether, for example, let's say you're a coach and that expectation and in, in, in you're on a, at, at a game, you're chaperoning, you're coaching, whatever, you're on the bus to or fro, that this is not just while you're in your classroom, but it is anytime you are representing and act and as part of your job. And so we wanted just to clarify what um, expectations are for employees um, and so that parents know what those expectations are. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Ms. Ms. Atkins, do you have anything? Um, I have actually one suggestion that's kind of a nod to Ms. Atkins, uh, which is uh, the term political has gotten quite gray, I believe, uh, recently. And so um, perhaps we can consider including a definition of what political is uh, in our um, policy. It's pretty clear that if it is um, part of a specific campaign or a specific candidate, then that would um, qualify. But I think there's also some gray area around that. And mm -hmm. in um, the vein of trying to make our policies more clear, then perhaps include that. Okay. Anything else? And Mrs. Shea, may I add to that? I also think it may be wise in that definition of what it is at Henrico County Public Schools. Similar to the public forum, what the public forum is for Henrico County Public Schools. Thank you. Anything else on this item? All right, Dr. Cashwell? Uh, yes, thank you. Next, I um, want to provide an opportunity to review proposed revisions to policy P9-01-001, and that is suspicion of fraudulent activity by a Henrico County Public Schools employee. Any thoughts on this side? Any thoughts, comments, concerns? How about this side? All right. Thank you. That concludes this item. Next item. For the next item, Mrs. Alsop will be coming forward to provide an overview of our federal grant funding for 2022-2023. Um, and I see her making her way there to the podium. A little short, so, okay. Can you do a mic check? I couldn't hear you. All right. Mic check one. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Good afternoon, Chairman Shea, Vice Chair Kinsella, Dr. Cashwell, Dr. Tigan, and school board members. It is my pleasure to present to you information regarding federal grant applications for the 2022-2023 school year. As a reminder to the board, these are federal and state grants that Henrico County Schools applies for annually. I would like to also thank our grant coordinators for their work on writing the applications and providing opportunities and access for our students.
This afternoon, I will present information regarding our Title I, Part A, Title II, Part A, Title III, Part A, and Title IV, Part A federal grants. Each of these grants has a connection of support to one or more of the Henrico strategic goals. The federal grants were written with a focus on reviewing division needs and identifying opportunities where grant funds would be able to support. Federal grants are estimated to be just over $13.3 million. The Title I Part A, Title II Part A, and Title IV Part A grants for the 22-23 school year were prepared using leveled funding. Based on preliminary allocations received from the Virginia Department of Education, the Title I Part A grant is projected to have an increase. Final grant allocations from the Virginia Department of Education are not available until September. It is interesting to note that our final allocation has been lower than the preliminary allocation for the past three years. So we write our grants using leveled funding. This means that we write the grants using last year's numbers. The Title III grant funding projections are based on the 21-22 funding as the allocation is not released until September. The current written grant is for $417,000 as the initial grant application does not include the subgrant funding for immigrant youth. However, it is expected that the total grant amount will reflect the projected number of $490,000. Title I Part A is anticipated to be $10.6 million. Title I Part A funds additional financial assistance to schools with high numbers of students receiving free or reduced lunch. The grant award provides Title I schools with instructional staffing to support literacy and mathematics. Family advocates and funds to support family engagement are components of each school's budget. Funding is designated for instructional programming, such as supplies, including but not limited to classroom and bookroom libraries, additional digital resources, and manipulatives. The Library at Home Initiative ensures students in our Title I schools receive books for their home libraries. Pre-K support staff and resources support the Early Learning Preschool Program. A portion of Title I funds support the McKinney-Vento Program by providing full-time staff, instructional resources for students, transportation for out-of-zone and district students, and assistance with school fees for students experiencing homelessness. As a requirement of the grant, funds are also set aside for local Henrico County neglected institutions serving HCPS students such as John G. Wood School. Professional learning opportunities are a mandatory component of the grant and are also included in the application. This grant is coordinated by Dr. Cassandra Willis, our Title I specialist until July 1st. <laughs> the Title I application was prepared using direct certification numbers to identify 22 schools for Title I services. Direct certification numbers represent the number of students who may also be receiving SNAP, TANF, and Medicaid. Direct certification represents categorically eligibility for free meals. These 22 schools will operate using the school-wide model, which allows funds to be used for all students. During the 2022-2023 school year, we will add Longin and Seven Pines Elementary Schools. Title II Part A is anticipated to be just over 1.5 million. The purpose of Title II Part A is to increase academic achievement for all students through improving teacher and administrator quality. The Title II grant will support the division through funding an intervention specialist to support a coherent plan for ensuring students of all abilities are represented 
in the design, delivery, and assessment practices within each building. Reading and math instructional coaching positions will support identified division needs, such as two literacy coaches for secondary schools and a math specialist for an elementary school. Professional learning opportunities will focus on Henrico's strategic plan with an emphasis on identified areas. The areas of focus will be special education, equity, diversity, culturally responsive practices, behavior support, social emotional learning, mental health supports, leadership, family engagement, instructional coaching, and all core subjects. This grant is coordinated by Christina Alsop. Title III Part A is anticipated to be $490,000. Title III Part A is utilized to provide teachers with instructional support through instructional assistance, instructional supplies to support English learners, as well as provide professional learning for division leaders and school staff. A portion of the funds also provides supports for family education programs, such as parents as educational partners for parents and guardians who do not speak English. This grant is coordinated by Sarah Modrak, the Title III Specialist. Title IV Part A is anticipated to be just under 800,000. Title IV Part A funds are intended to improve students' academic achievement by increasing the capacity of school divisions to provide all students with access to a well-rounded education, improve school conditions for student learning, and increase the effective use of technology. Funding from the Title IV Part A grant will be used to provide elementary and middle school science coaches to model and support science instruction. The dedicated McKinney-Vento social worker assists school staff in discovering and alleviating McKinney barriers to school attendance and meeting the wellness needs of students experiencing homelessness. Funds have also been set aside for college AP student fees to support the division focus on increasing access for students. Engaging learner-centered experiences will continue with the digital resource Nearpod. Second Step licenses will provide needed resources focused on safety and wellness for our secondary students. This grant is coordinated by Christina Alsop. <laughs> Again, I would like to thank each of the federal grant coordinators. The work of federal grants requires the highest level of collaboration with many Henrico County public schools and Henrico County stakeholders. On behalf of the grant coordinators, we would like to thank each of our thought partners for collaborating with us to meet the needs of our Henrico students by providing valuable opportunities and access. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I forgot what side I'm on, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go this time, this way. Uh, Ms. Atkins. Thank you. Well done. I appreciate you and your team and their hard work. Uh, grant writing is difficult. It's complicated, and then you throw in all the numbers that you have to make sure are accurate. And I appreciate um, the level of expertise, expertise um, that's being used to make these things happen. Uh, and without you and your team and your dedication, those numbers wouldn't look like that. And so I just want to say thank you and well done on your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Uh, thank you. No, I'm Ms. Ms. Kinsella. Oh, I think I just, I'd just like to highlight the addition of two new schools um, and the one in my district, Long and Elementary. Um, I, I'm just pleased to see that they're going to be getting um, some of the resources that they need. And then I think I would just ask for my colleagues to consider um, if there is any extra money at any time going forward. Um, I know that we were fortunate enough to add additional advocates, family advocates in, in our schools for the upcoming uh, school budget. Um, just knowing how much they do in our communities um, 
I would just like for uh, my colleagues to consider and perhaps have discussions with Dr. Cashwell and her team at um, the rate that they are paid our advocates because they're so they're they're vital um, they're an important part of what we do um, and just knowing that we've had some turnover in that department I just wanted to uh, bring that forward and thank you so much for this presentation I appreciate it thank you Ms. Kinsella well, I want to start Ms. Alsa by saying I noticed uh, your uh, heightened uh, excitement when you pronounced the ones that you were the main grant writer on so I just wanted you to know that that was noticeable but in all seriousness again I echo the sentiments in regards to the work that you do as well as your staff and you know when you look at out of the 22 schools that are title one seven of them are my schools uh, and I know um, the, 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 the needs that we have and, and, and specifically how these funds increase our ability to service our students. Um, I'm particularly excited um, about the increased uh, effort and intentionality with early learning preschool support staff and classroom resources because we do know how imperative and important um, the foundation is for success later on for those before they even get to school. And we do know that there's kind of um, uh, uh, I would say um, some students are more prepared for kindergarten than others. And I think that, you know, we're very intentional of saying, listen, we want to help you to develop that foundation so that your child can be successful. So thank you for the highlighting what we are um, improving on and what we're adding to. And I look forward to the results of our investment. So thank you. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Um, I just have uh, two quick questions. Um, you talked a little bit about using direct certification um, to find our numbers. I know that with um, having free meals for all of our students through the federal funding the last couple years, which has been fantastic, um, we don't have those free and reduced application numbers like we traditionally do. Um, as next school year, that federal program for lunches will not be um, available. Do we um, anticipate now that we'll have applications for free and reduced lunch, some of these numbers to shift uh, up or down compared to the direct certification? I believe with us, um, we kind of started maybe two years ago using the direct certification number because it gives us more of an accurate number for all of our schools uh, because we may have families that would qualify for free and reduced lunch but select not to complete the application or where we have, we actually have some of our schools that are called um, our community eligibility program schools where all students received free lunch prior to the pandemic. Therefore, those schools, parents mainly do not fill out an application. So by going with the direct certification, we're able to ensure we have an equal playing field across all of our schools when looking at them. Great explanation, I appreciate that. So even with the free and reduced applications coming back, we're gonna be utilizing this direct certification in order to determine our numbers. Is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. Thank you. Um, and then as we look at our um, schools that you were talking about that we um, provide um, services to, our lunch services to all of our students in the addition of Long and Seven Pines, is there, um, a baseline threshold like percentage that we look at for those schools and if so what is it? So each year we kind of determine and look at the numbers because they do shift each and every year. We also take a look at how much funding we're projected to have so that we can ensure that by going down the list and serving schools, we're able to give them a quality service uh, instead of just a service in there. This year, our cutoff was 50.9% um, is where our cutoff was. I appreciate it, and, and that actually, that also helps me understand that it's not, as soon as the school gets to 50.9, they qualify and will get more funding for it. We are juggling the amount of funding and the amount of need to make sure that it's a quality offering. Correct. Great, thank you. Um, anything else, colleagues? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Cashwell, that concludes uh, that item. And I believe that concludes items from you, unless I'm mistaken. You got it. That concludes items from me. And uh, thank you again, Mrs. Alsop, and thank you, board members, for your questions and comments uh, related to the federal funding. And we'll be seeking your acceptance of the, uh, those grant fund applications uh, at our monthly meeting. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell.
colleagues, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Does anyone have unfinished business? Hearing none. The next item on the agenda is new business. Colleagues, any new business? All right, hearing none. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the announcement of meeting dates. The next school board's next meeting will actually be at 6.30 right here. Uh, but after that, it will be on Thursday, June 3rd, 2022 at 1 p.m. for a work session and a monthly meeting at 6.30 p.m. The meeting time may be adjusted if need needed. This work session is... June 23rd, sorry, that will be June 23rd, 2022. Now this work session is adjourned.